thank you very much. Uh, I'm Ron Tompkins. I'm a surgeon and a scientist from, uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, from Mass General Hospital in Boston. What I wanted to talk about today was uh, a formation of a consorted effort uh, among the Harvard facilities, institutions, and there are 30 of them, um, in order to organize um, towards the benefit of understanding and treating ME uh, in a much more organized fashion among our institutions. Uh, there are many, it turns out that there are many people who individually at uh, Harvard have been contributing to uh, both the clinical and research side of ME for many years, but have been doing it in their silos. Uh, I was very heartened to um, find that many are very interested to move forward in a concerted effort uh, collaboratively to gather. This doesn't happen at our institution very um, often, so I'm quite heartened by it. Now, the, the other comment that I'll make just from the beginning here is that this is a forward-looking document. Uh, what I'm going to share with you is more of a vision, um, and if it were to eventually be, be financially fully supported, would be a marvelous resource uh, for the community. So <clears throat> let me first say that uh, we're uh, grateful to the Open Medicine Foundation who have funded uh, three collaborative centers, uh, one for a considerable amount of time run by Dr. Ron Davis at Stanford. Ours is a new one um, and reflects, uh, in my opinion, uh, the success of a 20-year collaboration with Dr. Davis um, in some of our prior activities, and I would hope that this new ME Center, ME CFS Center at Harvard would uh, just build on that prior experience. And very recently, uh, the decision to fund uh, Dr. Ber Berquist um, at the University of Uppsala as uh, three collaborative centers. Our center at Mass General was co-directed by Winsong Xiao, who has been very instrumental both at MGH and as well at Stanford to better understand uh, data. You can see there's quite a number of people at Mass General um, <clears throat> together with some individuals you might know at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Tony Com uh, Komaroff and David Sistrom. We have a sleep specialist who's very interested to participate with us, Janet Mulligan, and her uh, very large research group in unrefreshing uh, sleep. Um, <clears throat> we also have University of Birmingham and University of Nottingham participants. Uh, Janet Lord is uh, chair of immunology at the University of Birmingham and quite helpful. And in the area of metabolism, uh, Philip Atherton and Paul uh, Greenoff are classically trained individuals in metabolism and will be a very important part of our center. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in a moment. Two individuals that I'm very pleased uh, and, and we wish to uh, fully develop collaborations with is Maureen Hansen, who lives generally in our area of Northeast uh, the United States and uh, Jonas Berquist. Uh, lastly, there's been a group in proteomics, which is really one of the most superb groups uh, we found in the uh, virtually in the entire world at Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, and we're very pleased to have them to participate with us. There are a number, I, I really don't have time to talk about each of the activities, but let me highlight, I'll take the top one uh, and go into a little bit more detail but the next two slides, I'll give you a general idea of the various uh, aspects. What we're taking advantage of are some special facilities that exist within the Harvard institutions. And uh, they have not in the past dedicated any of their efforts to MECFS, but with a little encouragement and uh, hopefully some support, uh, we will take advantage of some very special uh, facilities. There's quite a number of people here also who um, are well known in their fields, 
uh, who we are going to, we are encouraging to extend their already extensive knowledge into a better understanding of uh, MBCFS. Um, <clears throat> first, we're interested in skeletal muscle biopsies, to be honest about it. Uh, in America, we would say, if you ask Willie Sutton, he was a famous bank robber, why do you rob banks? And he says that's where the money is. So uh, it's a, a pretty obvious place to go. Post-exertional malaise is such a big piece of uh, MECFS that, and we know a tremendous amount, and I'll show you a little bit of it, about how skeletal muscle works. And when it doesn't work well, why it doesn't work well. And we think that some of that effort should be also placed uh, to understand MECFS more. Now in the United States, uh, we, are, we would not be allowed to do, uh, <clears throat> for patients with disease, you can do skeletal muscle biopsies. But for normal individuals, um, it would not actually be allowed. I, th I think the United Kingdom is much more uh, straightforward about that. As a country and as a uh, research group, the MRC, they're very interested in aging and inflammation and how does dysfunction uh, over time and age in perfectly normal individuals occur. And it's, it's quite reasonable to do muscle biopsies and whatever you need to understand the process of aging and the impact of inflammation. So uh, our colleagues at the University of Birmingham and Nottingham um, have been doing this for, they have a large MRC center and they've been studying this for decades. And uh, those are perfect age matched, uh, activity matched, gender matched individuals that we can use for comparison as we do studies uh, with muscle biopsies in patients. There's a, an organ, there's a, one of our doctors at, was at the Mass General and now at the Brigham, does an invasive CPET, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And he's identified what is called preload failure. And in that, there are two forms, a low flow and a high flow. And they're in, in, in a hundred, more than 150 ME patients who have been well characterized individuals. And a better understanding of that etiology and preload, it's a, it's a very big part of uh, postural uh, uh, tachycardia, uh, would be a very important aspect for us to evaluate. Uh, we have plasma samples in those individuals before at the peak of exercise and one hour after exercise. And we think that's a treasure trove to identify some uh, metabolites and po polypeptides and other proteins that are released into the blood and in comparison to normal individuals that will give us a great understanding. Uh, a little bit later you hear from Michael uh, Van Elsiker about our efforts in neural inflammation. He's uh, working in the Martino Center which is one of those highly specialized centers over the last few decades in the area of of uh, magnetic resonance, but uh, many of his studies are coordinating it with positron emission tomography, which gives you a tremendous understanding about the role of neural inflammation. We would, it's interesting, we have our first inaugural meeting on Friday this week of our, uh, this coming week of our group, and I organized the room for 55 people. But over, as over the last six weeks, it became aware that we were having this uh, first meeting. And I've had over 150 doctors and scientists actually asking could, to come to the meeting. So uh, I have to say, Harvard Medical School is a little bit unusual. It has more than 12,000 faculty. It's, uh, it's an, a group, and I'm very confident that we can engender the active participation of many, not only seasoned investigators, but young uh, uh, 
scientists and doctors who would be very interested to work with us. And so what a vision would be a creation of a clinical center of excellence, uh, both including clinical care, the supports that are required, as well as research. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the preload failure. There are opportunities with computerized adaptive testing. Uh, I know that as patients, you fill out all kinds of questionnaires, and sometimes it dri can drive you crazy. You can often determine where you are in a particular clinical domain, not asking all 30 questions, but simply uh, using computer artificial intelligence, only a few questions. We also serve to enhance the public education and awareness uh, in our area. We had one meeting uh, a few months ago that had over 700 uh, allied health professionals at uh, Mass General. Those are not doctors, but they're nurses and therapists and others who came to one of our presentations. And I think that was, there were some marvelous questions. There was a lack of awareness to begin with, but uh, at the end of the, of the session, there, we have a treasure trove of wonderful questions coming from very honest individuals. And we would hope in the long run that we'd be able to conduct some clinical trials uh, and serve as a, a clearinghouse for that. I will show, uh, this is uh, uh, the rationale and aims. It's not important to read all of it, but this is about the skeletal muscle biopsies in patients. Um, you appreciate, I don't want you to, to worry about the details here, but you appreciate that expression of genes is specific for a tissue. It's a little bit like politics, in which it, uh, politics are local. And uh, so here on the left, you see the genes that are upregulated are red and are downregulated are green. That's in the blood. You see it's almost exactly the opposite in the center of that screen. You see skin. There are genes that respond in skin that are very different than what it is in blood. And the same is true for muscle and fat. So you get a very different presentation. This is a general concept. Uh, one area that I spent 30 years on is, is uh, inflammatory and metabolic response after serious injury. We had a very large study in which <clears throat> we were studying burns and in trauma. The mortality rates of the patients we were studying was on the order of 20%. So they're very serious injuries. What happens after that is your metabolism increases tremendously. It can double. And the nutrition and the source for calories in that upregulation changes. And what, for the most part, it really comes from burning fat. And, uh, but it's very important to know nutritionally how your metabolic system is supported. I suspect, although there's no data for this, that in ME, that there's a reduction in metabolic rate and a change in the source to create that energy. It, the choices are fats, proteins, and sugars. And I suspect it's quite different, but uh, it's something that is critically important to understand. Uh, what happens in muscle? after serious injury, we have about 30,000 or so genes, and about 4,500 of them are differentially, are their gene expression changes. That's very, that's about a little more than 10% of, of your genes, and they're genes that are specifically necessary for the normal function of muscle. And after injury, there are very specific changes. And I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, for example, here, you don't need to know the details here, but of these 100 genes, every one of them is related to, pro to protein synthesis into skeletal muscle fragments 
actin, and myosin, which gives you the strength in muscle. Every one of them is grossly upregulated. The protein synthesis in those muscles is greatly upregulated. It's a question of, of what exactly happens in ME, but the tools are available to actually study that specifically. Here's some, a series of highly regulated uh, genes in muscle, but these are topics that I know you've heard discussed about in ME. One is an increased muscle contracture, energy expenditure, insulin resistance, muscle atrophy, fatty acid metabolism. You can find very important, very specific, very systematic information in these kind of studies that give a definitive answer about what is actually happening in skeletal muscle and what would be happening in post-exertional malaise. Here's a very detail about insulin resistance. And insulin resistance can also happen. In, and you can discern the muscle's role in that insulin, development of insulin resistance. So I'll give you a quick summary here. <clears throat> it turns out after injury, there's a lot of regeneration of skeletal muscle. There's also a lot of degradation. Uh, the insulin pathways, fat metabolism, a lot of energy uh, metabolic features change dramatically. And we're curious specifically of those changes that would occur after ME. This is just describing the fact that we're going to use the United Kingdom normal volunteers as an excellent source to compare uh, the studies in patients to better understand what is specific about ME and what is specific about other features that occur naturally with uh, age and inflammation. <clears throat> You'll hear more about this, so I won't mention it. From, uh, you hear from Michael in just a little bit, but, but that is very exciting. And I'll end with this. The Clinical Center of Excellence, which uh, is, a, is a pipe dream at the moment, we would very much like uh, to make a reality. You know, if you're going to have that, you not only have to have all the medical disciplines participating in the center, understanding the, the specific aspects of ME for their discipline and to be readily available. Uh, and, and that's what we have in our heart center, in our cancer centers, transplant centers. I mean, the hospitals, hospitals are just full of specialty centers. And I would like for us to create the same one uh, for ME. And I'll just end with that very positive note, and hopefully we'll have some opportunity to uh, expand on that in future meetings. Thank you so much.